Hey, and welcome back to the least knowledgeable sim racing channel. Recently, my friend Will from Boosted Media made a video on the back of all the drama surrounding the sim racing 604 situation. As things were winding down, Will took a moment to extrapolate the greater implications of what had happened and how it relates to sim racing, creators, and online content mediums as a whole. You can probably already tell that this is going to be a far more general and borderline philosophical discussion rather than something explicitly related to sim racing. If that's not up your alley, that's completely fine. Just hit that dislike button twice for us on the way out. For everybody else, I'm going to try to shed some perspective on this situation as someone who exists on both sides of the fence. Firstly, for those unfamiliar with the situation, the TLDR is that Mike from Simracing604 recently did an expose video on a Simracing modder group who were widely known to have been stealing and remonetizing content from other creators for years. Truly nefarious, bottom feeding stuff. To go with this, they would also use DMCA strikes to take down legitimate content from the modders from whom they were stealing. It's almost sickeningly insidious. Mike, Seemingly no longer able to stay silent about this, and compelled by his innately good nature, spoke up. For his trouble, he was hit with multiple copyright infringement strikes against his channel, which resulted in him nearly losing the channel entirely due to the automated processes employed by YouTube. It took the solidarity of the entire sim racing community to come together on his behalf in order to get this overturned. It reignited that long-standing discussion of why are creators on YouTube treated as being guilty until proven innocent? Well, that discussion requires a deeper look into business ownership, incentive structures, and the nature of copyright. For those not familiar with my past, I began adulthood as a guitar player, audio engineer, and record producer. In 2012, I authored my first book. This book, in its digital form, was widely pirated. I expressly didn't put any protections in place in order to not penalize those people who were paying their own hard-earned money for it. The caveat of taking the noble approach, of course, is that the nefarious elements always wait in the shadows to pounce on opportunity. As a result, my book was spread far and wide. On principle, this was almost a good thing. Even though I wasn't earning from my years of labor that went into authoring the book, at least I could rest on the idea that the knowledge contained within was being spread throughout the community. The problem lies with the fact that the book started appearing on piracy hubs and cloud services which charged membership fees for content access. Now, this was something else entirely. Somebody else was now taking content created by myself and innumerable other creators, severing us from the earnings and instead re-monetizing it to legitimize their own bottom feeding platforms. Our only defense in this instance was the DMCA process. Because most hosts, cloud services, and content sites are implicitly bereft of ethics, they would require us to follow the format of the DMCA letter structure down to the word. Only then would it constitute a legally binding document. Every single time, I tried to write a letter in good faith, calling on the host's better nature and moral sensibilities, I was rejected. This is ultimately what you deal with when running business and living life as a creator in an environment where everybody is out for themselves. The only reason illicit content is removed from these sites is because failure to comply with DMCA leads to very real penalties. Now take note of how similar this experience is to the occurrence of the thieving modding group and Mike's encounter with them, except the fact that DMCA in this case served the greater good instead of being abused in order to prevent it. The problem is that in reality things are rarely ever simply black and white. DMCA isn't the evil here. It lies in how it's wielded. In the 90s, when I first landed on the internet, it was the bona fide Wild West. Content piracy was rampant and there was a distinct lack of centralization despite the best efforts of companies like Yahoo, Microsoft and AOL. It was obvious that as the internet grew, this would have wider implications on many industries and society itself. We had to develop a safeguard for content creators to prohibit services such as Napster really allowing the illicit trade of copywritten content. The subsequent deterioration of my industry, the music industry, after the advent and popularization of MP3s is a testament to why this was so necessary. MP3s upended an admittedly lecherous music industry, but also many independent creators along with it. 
As everyone struggled to work out what to do in this new paradigm, we ended up with a power vacuum. As nature abhors a vacuum, it was subsequently filled with monopolistic giants such as Spotify and Apple Music. The idea that creators would receive barely anything back from their own art was now entrenched in the business model, and they had no other recourse but to submit to these monopolies. You're probably waiting for that part where I turn this around and give you the happy ending, but the truth is, it just isn't one. The music industry, at an independent level, has been utterly ravaged and we've never truly recovered. Our budgets kept shrinking and our working situation kept diminishing until one day I woke up and said, you know what, I no longer want to be a part of this. The music industry dream I had in my childhood in the 90s, where I got to work for months on a single record with a band as producer behind a large format analog console, is now effectively dead. That situation only exists at the very top 0.1% of the music industry still being bankrolled. So how does this relate to DMCA strikes and sim racing you ask? Well, had we just found a way to safeguard the integrity of copyrighted art earlier via enforceable legal mechanisms, this situation may never have eventuated. I may not have had a career working with so many intensely gifted musicians who had to maintain two day jobs just to supplement their passion. This applies to both the modded content we spoke of recently, as well as Mike's right to speak out about it. What we need is a legal framework to take down sites run by teams repackaging content illicitly without an entire community needing to draw attention to it and potentially risking their own livelihoods. We also need to make sure that this framework is flexible enough to be applied fairly so that we can draw a distinction between fair use cases, such as Mike potentially showcasing stolen content in a video, and the stolen content itself. To draw a further case in point, I now run a software development company. The only thing standing between us and Google search results full of illicit copies of our software is DMCA. DMCA ensures my partners, employees, and contractors are able to cover their rents and bills and that the company remains profitable because they're seeing a return for their hard work. This has to remain true for the sim racing community as well. We have to ensure that the hard work of modders is safeguarded from those looking to exploit it. The hard part is making sure those same legal mechanisms then don't backfire on us and work against creators making legitimate content on platforms such as this. YouTube airs on the side of caution with DMCA and has an automatic flagging system which attempts to mitigate their liability in the case of any possible infringements. They're simply looking after their own best interests first, as any company would. Unfortunately, in this case, it almost resulted in a situation where Mike lost his channel completely unjustly. This is a sobering realization for myself and other creators. It means that none of us are safe under the current paradigm. However, if these mechanisms were removed, I know that my work, my company's work, my client's work would no longer be safe either. We're walking a tightrope in the era of digital rights management, ladies and gentlemen. There are many conversations to be had and much ground to be covered. Here's to hoping that we actually have those conversations. Until next time, I'll see you later.